how can we find a vantage from which to approach Rorty that allows us to, you know, learn from his insights and not end up just dismissing him out of hand, calling him a relativist, etc. cetera, uh, because there's so many caricatures and really harsh critiques of Rorty for just being an irresponsible philosopher, for having incoherent positions. And eventually, I think because of my training, I thought, well, what if we read Rorty as a political theorist rather than a traditional sort of philosopher who's going to give us systematic positions on truth and metaphysics and epistemology? Because the way I've been trained as a political theorist and this is in the spirit of people like Sheldon Wolin, you know, that the historical research in view theorists, not as giving us truths about the world, but making interventions into particular social political contexts to try to get us to see the world differently. So that evaluating Rorty from the point of view of his, the coherence of his philosophical stances just seemed to miss what he was doing and result in all these negative treatments. Um, so eventually that became my angle, um, reading Rorty politically, if you will. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My guest today is Professor Chris Vopario. Uh, he is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Lynn University in Boca Raton, Florida. He is the author of two books on the philosopher Richard Rorty. Uh, one is titled Richard Rorty, Politics and Vision. And more recently, uh, Reconstructing Pragmatism, Richard Rorty and the Classical Pragmatists. He is also one of the editors of, or co-editor of the Rorty Reader, and another volume uh, which is really interesting on, on philosophy and philosophers, which includes the unpublished papers of Rorty between 1960 and 2000. And another volume, uh, What Can We Hope For? Essays on Politics, that I believe is the most recent. Professor Boparo received his PhD in political philosophy from the New School for Social Research in New York City in 2004. Um, welcome, Chris. Thank you for accepting my invitation. So yeah. I wanted to ask you, beginning with your academic background, what initially got you interested in the study of social and political theory? And uh, then more specifically, what uh, sparked your interest in Richard Rorty and the broader field of pragmatism? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I studied political science and economics as an undergraduate and ended up after deciding not to go to law school, which I'm, I'm glad I decided. Um, I ended up in a master's program, political science, and studying international relations, doing some comparative work. But I started to find myself drawn toward international relations theory. And as a result of also having some political theory courses that were required, I found that my interest were on the theory side of things. So I eventually switched over to political theory. And then after a master's degree, I went to the New School for Social Research, as you mentioned, in New York City. And I think that's where I first encountered Rorty and his writing um, in a seminar uh, taught by a sociologist on postmodernism. Um, this is in the early 1990s. And I had this experience, perhaps, that others have had where I was really drawn to his broader critiques of the Cartesian Kantian tradition of philosophy and a lot of the entrenched assumptions. So I, I was attracted to his work, but I also found myself sort of, you know, repelled on the other side because I felt like his conclusions or the implications for politics were kind of too banal and too, you know, liberal. And it was that um, tension you know, that sort of kept me in dialogue with Rorty. And soon after that, it was a, uh, a year-long seminar taught by Richard J. Bernstein at the New School. Um, and Bernstein happened to be Rorty's friend from when they were undergraduates together at the University of Chicago in the late 1940s. And one of the highlights of that seminar was uh, coming to class one day and find Rorty sitting there uh, because he was in New York and Bernstein just said, okay, class, you know, go at him. And I get to ask him whatever I wanted. And 
It was after sort of failed starts on dissertations on Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Michel Foucault, where I found that whatever I happened to be writing, I was back to arguing with Rorty. And finally, I said, I have to just follow this and see where it goes. Wow. That's, yeah, that's a fascinating story. And returning, returning and again, again, that's a, an indication of something, something is going on that needs to be addressed. Uh, I wanted to also ask you about what you find uh, in your view, what you find that sets your style of engagement with Rorty apart from other ways of doing Rorty scholarship. But I mean, um, maybe we can talk about what is uh, what you pay attention to in Rorty's thought and work that might be overlooked or underappreciated or misunderstood by other scholars. Okay, yeah, this, this I think was significant for me. And I think part of it had to do with being trained as a political theorist rather than a philosopher. Um, but it really was the result of a sort of crisis in the process of working on my dissertation on Richard Vorty, where it was a kind of crisis and an epiphany um, that proved pivotal. You know, as I got further and further into Rorty's writings and some of the work on Rorty, I realized that the plan I had for a kind of sympathetic critique, um, but a critique nonetheless, had already been done. You know, and not only had it already been done, there were, you know, hundreds, if not over a thousand pieces of secondary literature on Rorty that had made similar critiques. And it really forced me to grapple with the question, you know, what is the point of another critique of Rorty for where he falls short? I mean, not only has it already been done, but Rorty seemed to be no worse for the wear, that he would simply shrug off these criticisms. And I remember there was a, um, an annotated bibliography published of work on Rorty. I believe it was around 2002, edited by Richard Romana. It had 1,200 entries, you know, books and articles on Rorty. Out of the 1,200, the editor Romana counted that there were only six that were positive or even remotely sympathetic. So then it sort of shifted like, okay, this is a, a topic for inquiry. This is still my dissertation that was in progress, which was, there's a phenomenon going on here. You know, number one, a lot of people are moved to say something in response to Rory. So he must have touched a nerve um, and he must be doing something that's interesting enough that people don't just ignore him, they engage him. But at the same time, why it's so, uniformly negative the responses to him that that in itself was perplexing so then as a result of all this my project became and i already written a few chapters that i had to abandon at that point how can we find a vantage from which to approach rorty that allows us to you know learn from his insights and not end up just dismissing him out of hand calling him a relativist uh, et cetera, uh, because there's so many caricatures and, you know, really harsh critiques of Rorty for just being an irresponsible philosopher, for having incoherent positions. And eventually, I think because of my training, I thought, well, what if we read Rorty as a political theorist rather than a traditional sort of philosopher who's going to give us systematic positions on truth and metaphysics and epistemology? Because the way I'd been trained as a political theorist, and this is in the spirit of people like Sheldon Wolin, you know, that the historical research in view theorists, not as giving us truths about the world, but making interventions into particular social political contexts to try to get us to see the world differently. So that evaluating Rorty from the point of view of his, the coherence of his philosophical stances just seemed to miss what he was doing and result in all these negative treatments. Um, so eventually that became my angle, um, reading Rorty politically, if you will. Reading Rorty politically while at the same time holding on to him as a philosopher. Is that right? Because he has he gives this reading of John Dewey and he says, 
He says something similar to what you said about him uh, regarding political enge uh, public engagements of Dewey regarding social issues, political issues. And then he says something interesting that, you know, the two sides of Dewey were not really that related to each other. Uh, and I don't think you, your position on Rorty is not that, even though he might say that about himself. He might say that on the side, in my private sphere, I do philosophy. And in my public, I have my, my public uh, commitments. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. In fact, that public private split was sort of the, you know, signature notions that Rorty introduced, and it was one that got a lot of criticism. And I think often it can be misunderstood. Yeah, I mean, so balancing the political theory and the philosophy, the politics and the philosophy became key. And while I initially was reading, let's say, Rorty's middle to late work, when he's already making a kind of explicit turn to writing about politics, contingency, irony, and solidarity, and then after his collection of essays, Truth and Progress, where he's explicitly writing about human rights and other global problems of the time, it was easy to see what he himself had called the priority of democracy to philosophy, you know, and that in another phrase, he put it, you know, we should put politics first and then tailor a philosophy to suit. Mm -hmm. And this sort of thing really annoyed philosophers. Um, but I think if you're interested in his writing on politics, you could see where he's going, where he said, you know, it should be democratic politics and, you know, as Dewey said, the social and moral problems of the day that should give philosophy its um, marching orders, its problems, rather than philosophers dealing with problems of only of interest to professional philosophers. So that was the way that his later work sort of shaped up. But then some years after, when I was working on that, um, the Rorty Reader, and delving into his early writings, which were more metaphilosophical in nature, more uh, analytic, I started to see that even in his, you know, traditional philosophy period, before he makes a turn to politics, his metaphilosophical orientation to uh, the practice of philosophy already was, let's say, attentive to what political theorists call the political. In other words, that there are things that philosophy can't decide for us and that we aren't simply constrained by the nature of reality or the way things are in themselves to believe what we believe, but rather there's agency and choices that we make in beliefs. So, I mean, in a slightly more technical way, Rorty called this like the paradox of meta-philosophy, which was basically his reading of a Western philosophical tradition that despite claims to be accessing truth and reality in the way things are, that nobody seems to agree. <laughs> and not only that, he said, um, each philosopher basically redefines the rules of the game to privilege their own position and to devalue others. And he said, you know, it's sort of a, a kind of game that can never be won because everybody's changing the relevant criteria. And to me, that you know, approach, which by the way, is also what orients him to pragmatism, because he viewed pragmatism, and this is, you know, 1961, 1962, as having a really interesting response to this metaphilosophical paradox, where rather than despairing of it, you know, and just trying to dig deeper to find those truths with a capital T, he said pragmatists make a virtue of necessity and they view it as a positive and they think, and this starts with Charles Sanders' purse, one of the early pragmatists, you can see it in William James, that their purse said there are moral virtues like self-control that save inquiry from um, anarchy. In other words, that we have to appeal to something outside of philosophy to settle the philosophical quarrel. And what Rorty says explicitly is that it is moral choice about which positions we hold. And to me, that really was a way of, you know, not just writing about politics as a topic, but understanding 
you know, um, like human plural, pluralism, value pluralism, and the inability of philosophy to solve these things for us as woven into his understanding of the history of philosophy. And that seemed to me to open the door to quote unquote political is in, in the fact that we humans need to hash these things out among themselves. Philosophy or theology, you know, they're not going to solve these things for us. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, I saw them as really intertwined, the mm -hmm. philosophical orientation and his, you know, political uh, orientation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for students who are interested in reading Rorty, uh, along those lines, do you have advice on how to read him so we, we, we wouldn't miss the philosophical work that is kind of hiding behind his uh, accessible political writing? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, on the one hand, Vordy has a very lively writing style, which makes him inviting to people who don't have philosophical training. But on the other hand, he was notorious for name dropping, throwing the names of philosophers in. And it can be intimidating and overwhelming if you don't already have a background in history of philosophy. But what I've come to think um, is that you know, Rorty adopted philosophical positions on, you know, the, the perennial questions of philosophy related to how we understand truth and reality and uh, so forth, as informed by his commitments to a democratic political um, and cultural uh, sphere. And that his seemingly, you know, irresponsible positions on philosophical topics like saying things like, well, truth isn't the sort of thing that we need a theory about. He's actually saying that not because he doesn't think there are viable theories of truth that one could persuade uh, others to adopt or one could defend, but rather if that becomes our central preoccupation, theorizing truth, then we're, you know, we'll never get around to dealing with the social and moral problems of the day. So if you think about his goal, as he said, you know, putting politics first and tailoring a philosophy to suit it, it helps understand why he's taking the positions that he wants to take. Mm -hmm. You said something about philosophers getting upset at some of his assertions. And um, so far, my impression is that sometimes what he's, what he's actually saying is not what the, his colleagues in philosophy departments are getting what they are understanding, but it's very close to that. It, he's saying something close to it, and he doesn't really bother to differentiate uh, what he is saying from what is making them upset. And uh, and that, I think, is related to a general stance against, you know, putting too much effort differentiating things that don't make a big difference. So is his style something that we need to, like, try to adjust for, calibrate for while reading him? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you're onto something there because um, Rorty's style, I think, you know, is responsible for both some of his most original insights, but also some of the frustration, you know, that philosophers experienced reading him, which maybe people outside of philosophy didn't experience, which was that he wasn't given to like systematic elaboration of his philosophical arguments. In fact, he said, you know, we should give up philosophical argumentation. And what he meant there is just the idea that, you know, and he had dialogues with people like Jürgen Habermas around this, that having the right reasons isn't going to naturally persuade people to your position. You know, that there's limits to what philosophical argumentation can do. So his style, I think, is really at the core of so many issues related to Rorty's reception. I mean, he really was a persona non grata in philosophy. Some called him the, the Trojan force of analytic philosophy because he played the game for a period of time from the mid 60s to the mid 70s and, and, and somewhat later, but seemed to be a sort of run of the mill analytic philosopher, but then he kind of blew it all up. And that is what led to this excommunication for all practical purposes. But people have written about, you know, the tension between Rorty's serious side and his kind of outrageous, 
outrageous or outlandish side. You know, Richard uh, Bernstein, as I mentioned earlier, said, you know, Rorty has this clever, outrageous side, but also this deep sense of moral commitment that sometimes is hidden. Um, others have argued, Santiago Rey, uh, Colombian philosopher, that if you take the outrageous Rorty out of the equation, you lose what was so powerful that both got people annoyed, but also brought about a lot of change in philosophy. Then in order to break the crust of convention, one of Dewey's phrases that Rorty liked, you have to use novel metaphors and say things that might not be immediately understood within existing paradigms, but eventually can enable people to see things from a different angle or in a different light. And a lot of that, I think, generated a backlash. I mean, he did also, I think, have a contrarian streak and he knew exactly where to poke <laughs> to hurt philosophers. And, and he seemed to relish doing that on occasion. But on other times he really was, and Bernstein has, has really been insightful about this, he underestimated the backlash to some of his stylistic quirks and his flippant remarks. Mm -hmm. And that hurt Rorty in the end, I think, both in terms of his reception and being taken seriously, by philosophers and also him personally. I mean, what he said hurt the most was that when people accused him of being morally irresponsible, you know, and just taking positions just to take them. And he really, that's what I think cut the deepest more than any philosophical critique. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, uh, what you mentioned there helps me highlight your work, your contribution. So I want to turn to, to your recent work on uh, on Rorty and co the comparative work with the classic classical pragmatists i noticed a review of your of that book by richard atkins from i believe boston college and in his review of your book he describes you as one of the peacemakers in american pragmatists and uh, i wanted you to talk a little bit about that as a style peacemaking comparing uh, with the attitude of peace which really in, enriches both sides in a comparison. And maybe peacemaking is a kind of prerequisite for doing certain types of comparative work. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you calling attention to that. I mean, part of it may be just a function of my own temperament um, as a person, as a thinker. I think another part of it, I learned from mentors like uh, Dick Bernstein, who talked about uh, what he called hermeneutic charity, you know, the idea that you sort of have to buy into a thinker and take them on their strongest footing to really do the interesting work and, and to come up with the incisive critiques and that people who are just, if you just reject them out of hand or too quickly, you just get a lot of thin analysis that really doesn't teach anyone much. So I think that's another factor. But it also seemed to be the peacemaking, what was needed in the particular moment in time when I entered the, the sort of community of people who work on American philosophy in general and pragmatism in particular. And I mean, just to contextualize this a bit, I mean, Rorty had a really negative reaction within analytic philosophy. Um, because, you know, he wanted to do the history of philosophy and write about politics and write about pragmatists um, who were viewed as not incisive or rigorous enough on a certain model of philosophy that's closer to, you know, logic and mathematics than, you know, broad humanistic thinking. So you had that negative reaction, but then even within people who already were scholars writing on the pragmatist tradition, which you know, came about in, at least in terms of its like post-World War II academic community as a group that was excluded by analytic philosophy, even that group was hostile to Rorty. And this is something that was uh, really um, surprising to me when I started to move in those communities because there was this visceral reaction against Rorty uh, for people who had worked on the pragmatic tradition, you know, um, and, you know, beginning in the 1980s, Rorty 
got credited with generating this resurgence, revival of pragmatism, you know, which on the one hand, people welcomed. But on the other, there was this backlash amongst people who worked on pragmatism because they thought Rorty, you know, had his own agenda at best. And at worst, he was misunderstanding and distorting the so-called classical figures of American pragmatism, like Charles Sanders Peirce, William James, and John Dewey. And it got to the point where people thought there's a double-edged sword here, and that even though pra pragmatism is being revived, it's a version of pragmatism that they didn't want out there, Rorty's own version. And it became a kind of unstated collective goal, like we need to discredit Rorty's version of pragmatism because it's misinforming people. Because Rorty identified the good parts of Dewey and the bad parts of Dewey. He says, well, we should get rid of the bad parts, like his emphasis on experience and metaphysics of experience, and just keep, and that was just sacrilege to people who were, you know, Dewey scholars. So in that context, where there was really this entrenched conventional wisdom that Rorty was a neo-pragmatist and, you know, the classical pragmatists were doing something very different. Some even arguing that Rorty shouldn't be considered part of the tradition at all. You know, and that wasn't my response to Rorty, um, in part because I learned from Bernstein, who read both the classical pragmatists and the neo-pragmatists alike. So in order to intervene in this really divided state, um, the peacemaking role became <laughs> the only way to start these conversations. Some of them happened in person, some were in, in published writing, but it really took about a decade and a half after Rorty's passing in, well, 2007 to see changes, you know, in the tectonic plates and people getting past this initial visceral, you know, reaction to Rorty and seeing, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, he is saying these other things that are quite doing in nature. Bringing, you know, Rorty's insights about the classical pragmatists and their influence on him into the conversation in a way that wasn't polemical, you know, that was scholarly, that has a lot of um, deep, you know, exegetical, textual uh, research behind it seem like a way to try to move this conversation to a different place. And I think that's what a lot of my work's been like uh, in the last decade or so, which isn't what I, you know, I started out as a critic of Rorty, a sympathetic critic, but a critic. And before long, I found myself defending him only because there were just caricatures, you know, of Rorty that were being bandied about. Mm -hmm. And I, again, going back to that hermeneutic charity, like, if you want to critique Rorty, fine, I do it myself all the time, but you really want to, you know, hit the mark and not just take him on a very weak footing or on his most outlandish statement without really understanding what's going on in the background. Right, right. It larger context of influence. For our listeners, uh, I would like to point to the chapters in your book, Reconstructing um, Philosophy. Uh, sorry, Reconstructing Pragmatism. I'm like getting mixed up with the uh, Dewey's reconstruction in philosophy and <laughs> uh, reconstructing pragmatism. Chap each, in each chapter, you put Rorty side by side in connection in the context of influence and similarity with another uh, philosopher from the classical pragmatic uh, or pragmatist tradition. So the chapters are Rorty and Peirce, Charles Sanders Peirce, Rorty and William James, and Dewey, Josiah Royce, and Jane Addams. So really rich study and uh, wanted to ask you what were some of the challenges in working on this volume it's a it's it's a lot of work uh, clearly yeah thank you i mean it certainly was and again I, I was trying to do things in a different tenor that weren't so um controversial but the i think the first challenge was the absence of existing scholarship that viewed Rorty's relation to classical pragmatism in a positive way or spent any time on commonalities and what might be shared because so much 
you know, of the work was saying, well, this is where Rorty misunderstood Dewey. This is where he, you know, uh, distorted Dewey. You know, the the Persians who work on Charles Sanders Peirce um, came up with a new label rather than neo-pragmatism. They called themselves new pragmatists. There's people like uh, Cheryl Misak, for example, um, just to distinguish their version of pragmatism from Rorty. It was that important for them to have that dividing line between Peirce and Peirce's understanding of philosophy and inquiry and Rorty's. So there really wasn't a lot to draw on. I mean, a handful of works over the years, but even people who were sympathetic to Rorty often didn't spend a lot of time on the classical pragmatists. And that was part of the divide. You know, people who were working on the classical pragmatists tended not to treat Rorty very seriously. And then a younger generation who only heard of pragmatism because of Rorty, um, like myself in a way, they often hadn't spent any time going back to Peirce's writings or digging into, you know, Dewey's work. So there wasn't much to build from. Um, and that meant going into some archival work. Um, there is a Richard Rorty archive at the University of California, uh, Irvine. And there was materials there that helped shed light on things. It meant going back to his less familiar, very early work where he did um, publish on Peirce and worked with a Peirce scholar. Paul Weiss, you know, chaired his dissertation at Yale. And then so going back to try to reconstruct where there was influence on Rorty, where there were commonalities, and then possible future points of contact where pragmatists can learn from both Rorty and the classical pragmatists without having to choose sides, so to speak, which always felt to me as, you know, kind of playing the piano with one hand where you weren't getting the full range of insights simply because, you know, Rorty wrote after, you know, the Second World War and a lot of changes in philosophy, the linguistic turn and, and critiques of foundationalism and so forth, that the classical pragmatists um, came, you know, too soon to see, yet they also had their own insights. And trying to bring the two together, to me, always seemed the way for pragmatism in the future to be as robust you know as, as it could yeah yeah I, Im I imagine one of the challenges would be i mean there was uh, other scholars who emphasized the contrast between Rorty and the classical thinkers the problem is that they easily find evidence for their position too and because there there's a these one-liners like purse his contribution was that he gave it an to he gave pragmatism a name and then inspired William James. And you talk about that in the first chapter. Uh, the the challenge is to go beyond those those isolated statements and get access to the context that Rorty himself made difficult to get to access uh, to get to the context. Um, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, that would be the second challenge. So there wasn't a lot of existing scholarship to learn from. The second challenge was Rorty's own writing, where he had those sorts of dismissive statements. And from his line, you know, the, about Peirce that really dismissed him, you wouldn't know that he had worked with a Peirce scholar and had studied Peirce extensively and had, um, you know, early writings on Peirce. He got, so yeah, Rorty in, in many cases was his own worst enemy. And part of the challenge that I had was to say, okay, yes, Rorty's made that claim, but here's all the other things that he left out. And to end up providing a little more of a systematic elaboration of his stances, which he really wasn't inclined to provide most of the time mm -hmm. in order to make them seem more, you know, more coherent than people tended to think. And that that, that had its own challenges, um, working against the grain of Rorty. But I tried to explain, if not justify it, by appealing to some of Rorty's own ideas about interpretation and this idea of inquiry as redescription. You know, Rorty had some nice 
illustrations where he talked about the difference between vertical metaphors in philosophy, where you try to get to the truth about something either by going up levels of ex abstraction, you know, like getting out of Plato's caves, for example, or going down into some deeper reality, some, you know, metaphysical level below appearances. And he, you know, rejected that for what he said are horizontal metaphors, where we tend to recognize this more in literature and art than in philosophy, where if there is a great novel or a great film, people write interpretations and criticisms, and then others write interpretations and criticisms of those criticisms, and you get horizontal proliferation, and no single one of them ever claims to have gotten, you know, the truth with a capital T about the work of art or the, the film, but rather you can illuminate by, you know, doing these re-descriptions of things and highlighting some elements over others to help, you know, bring a different view. So I thought of what I was doing in terms of re-describing Rorty in ways that he didn't really uh, write about his own position as maybe in some big picture in keeping with how he, uh, you know, approached the task of, of, you know, writing about other thinkers. I also wanted to ask you about this uh, edited volume on published essays on philosophy and philosophers. What did you find surprising? Uh, what did you discover that you did not expect or maybe you found interesting in, this, in, in the archives? Oh, sure. Yeah, the archives are, are something interesting. I mean, Rorty passed away in 2007. And at that time, he had just piles of boxes in his office at Stanford University. And there was a period of a few years where no one was sure where the boxes were. <laughs> and eventually they ended up at UC Irvine. So um, in about, I think it was 2012, I was there with a co-editor, uh, Wojciech Malecki, as well as another colleague, Colin Kobman. And I think we were probably the first people to visit the archives in terms of Rorty's scholars. And there's something like 60 boxes of stuff. So the first thing was just figuring out what's there, you know. Um, and then we fortunately had multiple people to do that. You know, at that time we were taking images of single pages with our phones. So after about a week, we had thousands and thousands of images and they had to be collated and then you know, converted to Microsoft Word through OCR and edited and all these things, which was a huge challenge. But there were, of course, there were some great finds. You know, there were smaller things. I mean, we learned Vordy was a keeper of things. I mean, he had all sorts of letters he had written throughout his life to his parents, to other philosophers, letters he had received, you know, um, from famous thinkers like John Rawls or Alan Bloom or a letter from Michel Foucault, which was wonderful to find and hold where Foucault really liked philosophy in the mirror of nature and spent a period of a year or two trying to find a French publisher to publish a translation. Um, I don't think it happened right away, but correspondence with Foucault or Slavoj Zizek, you know, Rorty inviting Zizek to come stay at his house in Virginia, you know, that you don't expect to see. But of course, the big finds were unpublished writing, you know, probably around two dozen like quality essays. So the more philosophical ones we published in that On Philosophy and Philosophers uh, collection that you mentioned. Some were a little more political in nature. Um, and then the more recent collection, again, co edited with Wojciech Malecki, um, What Can We Hope For? which was a line of Rorty's, um, I think has four new political essays. So those things were, you know, quite uh, defined. I mean, there's specific things that, you know, to talk about, there was a famous panel on philosophy and the mirror of nature right after it came out at an American Philosophical Association Eastern Division meeting where we know because it was published, you know, Ian Hacking and Jay Guan Kim wrote these really interesting critical 
reviews, if you will, uh, to Philosophy Mirror of Nature. And those were published uh, around 1980, 81. But it turns out Rorty, in the panel that they had, had a, an extensive response to the two of them that never were published. So getting to, you know, hear his direct responses to their critiques, which are quite, you know, I think uh, compelling in some ways, was really great to find. And Rorty never left instructions about these things. And so we don't know exactly why he didn't publish that, um, but it seems worth, worth getting out there. I was most surprised by the essay on the Kyoto School. Uh, right. It just continues to, to be surprising how widely he read. He read, continued to read in philosophy as well as literature and uh, cultural theory and so on. Yeah, and even a 10,000 word essay on Immanuel Kant, you know, that Rorty mostly was dismissive of Kant. And, and this was still critical, but it really read him in a much more rigorous, you know, textually uh, sourced way. So that was an interesting find, and we can only speculate why he didn't publish that. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't know. Yeah. Okay. Final question. So usually people ask about like general advice to philosophy students, but you know, I, I still want to ask that, but framed in terms of the maybe in your view the pressing philosophical or political questions of our time facing contemporary societies. Those that concern you the most, or maybe you think uh, you'd like to invite students of philosophy and political theory to think about, to consider, and uh, could be in relation to pragmatism uh, and engagement and reading of pragmatism. So that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, glad to try. I mean, the, the thing about Rorty that comes to mind is his so-called prediction of Donald Trump. Um, you know, a series of lectures that Rorty gave in uh, 1997, I believe, that were published as Achieving Our Country, a book that he wrote on leftist uh, thought um, in America, went viral on social media. Some of the passages, um, you know, during the 2016 presidential election here in the U.S., where a series of paragraphs that he had laid out, you know, in 1997 predicted the rise of a strong man figure who would turn back the clock on many gains through civil of civil rights and underprivileged minorities, racial minorities, sexual identity minorities, and how the left was going to pay a price for neglecting what sometimes we talk about as you know the white ethnic um, culture within the center if you will, of the United States of America, where you have more progressive liberal enclaves on the coasts, but in the center, because of the focus on difference, rather than building solidarity and Rorty, rather than focusing on economic injustice. Rorty was a big uh, labor union person, in part because of the time that he grew up in, in part because of his parents were um, left leftist activists. So, Rorty seems to have perceived some important things about changes that not only took place in, um, in the US, but across Western Europe as well, in terms of the rise of these um, right wing type figures and ideologies. So there seems to be something that Rorty might be able to teach us here. Um, the thing that I've focused on the most is Rorty's insights into um, what we could think about as epistemology. In other words, if we think about what has been called variously a post-truth or a post-fact kind of milieu where there really has been a loss of grounding and reality and all sorts of falsehoods um, not only being generated but being believed. And my sense is that Rorty had some key insights here that point to possible solutions. And I think what he understood most importantly is that so-called epistemic practices, practices around how we know the world and establish what facts are and what are true, 
they all presuppose the existence of a kind of ethical or moral community. In other words, it, you can't isolate what we perceive a fact to be or what we take to be knowledge about the world from affective bonds of community or solidarity between others in our community. So that if we really want to try to reestablish a connection to facts and reality and so forth, we're not going to do it simply by critiquing the falsehood, you know, from a cognitive or intellectual point of view. We're going to have to do the work of building these affective or felt connections between individuals. Um, and that that will be the path to getting back to a kind of, you know, um, more widespread interpretive community that doesn't each claim its own fact to justify, you know, their own positions, but rather is going to be a, a kind of pluralistic community that can learn from others. Mm -hmm. Now, to get there, I mean, this is what I think philosophers didn't like about Rorty is the way he just said, forget about epistemology and metaphysics and truth. What we need to do is this other work. I mean, that's philosophers didn't like that. But I think it really speaks to our moment where the first task is going to have to be. And Rorty was big on the conversation metaphor is having these conversations with the people with whom we disagree the most, you know, whether that's sometimes in our own families and friend circles, you know, um, but also more collectively. And that's going to involve listening to people that we, we might not want to listen to, <laughs> spending time with people that we might be repelled by. But until that work happens, we're never going to solve the larger issue of the complete impasse of conflicting truths and facts and interpretations. And there's been, you know, there's been research, uh, there's a philosopher named Tracy Yonera who's done very interesting research on sort of extreme cases of people who are members of hate groups like the KKK in the U.S. or other um, sort of fundamentalist, religious, perhaps, um, groups who ultimately leave and change their views. And studying what happens in those cases Tracy Ganera uses a Rorty'an idea of redemptive relationship. And the people who were spent, let's say, decades active in the KKK who come to reject those views typically have done so because of like a single relationship that they've built with another person that's existed over time and that it's allowed for this period of interaction. So it's not like sometimes we maybe hope or wish to believe in the humanities that simply reading an influential book will change people's lives overnight. I mean, that might happen occasionally, but it's really this hard work of building these relationships that actually seems to generate the best results. And in fact, when those people in hate groups are treated with kindness and empathy, there seems to be more of an opportunity to change their views than if we attack and critique you know, and reject them. Now, that's not always easy to carry out in practice, and maybe it's not even wise in certain instances, but I think it, it, it's a way to use some of Rorty's insights to inform, you know, actions that we can take to help with the partisanship and ideological divides that we see all around us today. Great, great. Uh, Tracy Ginera, I think the title of uh, one of her books is Nihilism and uh, and Rorty. Is that right? Uh, That's is, right. Is yes. that the work that you? I, I haven't read that book, but uh, I would love to. What you're describing, like the significance of sol solidarity, not necessarily with a with a group, but even with a single other individual. Yeah, that um, I'm trying to think. I'm thinking more of some separate articles. Okay. Um, okay that she wrote on redemptive relationships and hate groups. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'll try to look it up. I think the I background philosophical yeah. orientation is there in her reading of Rorty as giving us a different response to the problem of nihilism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, Professor Wolfario, thank you so much. Uh,
I uh, this was a great uh, discussion and learned a lot and I look forward to hopefully future conversations. Are you working on something at the moment? Uh, another project that is forthcoming? Um, is it too soon to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I have some ideas about a project related to Rorty and neopragmatism, like thinkers like Hilary Putnam and Robert Brandom and Joseph Margolis and people of his generation that might do the sort of um, peacemaking work <laughs> mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, attempted to do in terms of Rorty's relation to the classical pragmatists. So that is on a, a burner, maybe a back burner, but I'm also uh, doing some other things maybe that are a little more uh, rooted in the, the current social and political challenges we face and thinking about the critical study of whiteness and racial identity and some things there too. Okay, looking forward to it and looking forward to uh, hearing more about it later on. Thank you again. And uh, I guess we can uh, stop the recording and say our informal goodbye on the other side. <laughs> <laughs>